Hello, welcome to Rise Form Studio, episode number 62. I'm your host, Michael McAuliffe. This week, John Cavanaugh returns to tie up a variation of Renee Harop's Last Chance Cripple. This one's going to help represent the Cornuda. Materials list. For your hook, it's a TMC100, size 14. For your thread, Olive 8O. For your tailor shuck, it's amber colored Zelon over three wood duck fibers. For your abdomen, blue wing olive colored turkey biot. For your rib, small copper wire, thorax, caddis green, super fine dubbing. Your wing is two medium done CDC feathers. And for your hackle, medium done. How's everybody doing? I'm here today at Ramsey Outdoor in Succasana, New Jersey. This is the base for my guiding operation, the instructions in the fly tying school. I'm here today with John Cavanaugh. Uh, John's an amazing Catskill type tire. I think that's a good good way to describe what you do. He also does some great saltwater stuff. But uh, today he's going to tie us a variation on a Renee Harop pattern called the Last Chance Cripple. Uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, the variation that you're sure, going to tie? Sure. Uh, um, the variation that we're going to tie today is, is uh, for the Cornuda, the large uh, bluing olive that hatches in the Catchwell uh, region, usually in the first two weeks of June, uh, you know, seasonally depending on what kind of spring we're having. Right. Uh, <clears throat> one of my favorite hatches. Yeah, it's, it's a very uh, prevalent hatch in the Casco region, uh, particularly in the Delaware system. Uh, and I found that this particular pattern seems to work really well for the, uh, for the real finicky fish when they're, uh, when they're really getting snotty about the flies that they're looking at, the bugs that they're taking. This seems to be a pattern that works really well. Well, not a, I mean, it's worked for, like, a, it's worked as, as a charm up there for us. Sure. But I, I've also modified <laughs> this and fished this on a bunch of sure. little... little uh, you know, limestone creeks in PA where the yep. fish are real picky during the winter on real small olives. I tie it real little it, for them. It, it, this is uh, simply one pattern of, of several that I use uh, b based on Renee's pattern. Um, by simply changing the colors uh, that you're going to use and the sizes, you can duplicate uh, just about any mayfly that, that's here on the East Coast. Uh, this is just, I guess, what you would call maybe an East Coast version of Renee's uh, fly. Yeah. Okay. We'll go ahead and get time. So we'll, uh, we'll get started here. I'm using uh, Uni 8 o the thread for the fly. I'm going to create a little third base here. I'm going to top that off with uh, three wood duck fibers. This is a mallard dive wood duck, or you can use the, the real deal if you'd like. I'm going to use a little bit of uh, Zelon for a shuck. Find it. And I like Zelon for shucks, and I also like this amber color. A lot of, I see a lot of people use a really dark color for shucks. Uh, that doesn't make a lot of sense to me because if you've ever seen the shuck come off of an insect, it is definitely a, like a light amber color because there's no longer an insect inside of it. Uh, but yet I still see, see people uh, quite often use really dark shucks or really uh, an almost white shuck, which also doesn't make a lot of sense to me. Okay, the next thing we're going to do is add a rib. This is ultra wire, uh, copper, and a, a small size. I'm going to back up my thread a little bit here. Same place, same ending spot as the other two materials. Next is our biot, our turkey biot. This is pale olive I'm using. Now, when you tie this in, how do you like to tie it in, and, and which direction do you wrap it? Because yeah. I see a lot of sure, a lot of people doing this differently. There's, there's basically two ways to wrap uh, biots. There's a, there's a pronounced notch at the base of the biot, and if if you tie the biot in it like this along the top of the shank, and if the biot is facing to the right. You wind up with a distinct ribbing on the uh, on the biot when you wrap it. Uh, if you swing it around and you have that notch facing the other way, facing to the left, it, you'll get a st you'll still get a segment uh, segmented body, but it won't be as pronounced the ribbing. Right. It really is raised up when you have it the other way. So that's why we're, we're going to tie it this that way. We're going to have the uh, the uh, notch to the right, so we get the more pronounced uh, rib to the uh, biot. So we'll go ahead and we'll tie that in. And because this fly is a little bit on the chunky side, I like to add a little bit of a dubbed underbody before I wrap the biot. So I'm just going to put a little bit of, this is just the super fine and a chartreuse color, which I also use for the uh, thorax on this fly. Uh, when you see the, the uh, cornuta, the duns in the air, they're, they're much more of a regular olive color. But in fact, when the insect first is getting ready to hatch out of its uh, nymphal shuck, the uh, the coloration is much brighter. It's a it's a almost a fluorescent uh, like a chartreuse. Like it's a, it's like a pale chartreuse. chartreuse. Yeah. So that's what we, uh, we do for the, uh, the 
that's right, so we're going to go ahead and we'll get this buyout started. Try and space the turns a little bit so you, can, you get a nice even rib. This is a size 14 I'm tying on here, so you can usually get about four or five turns with the buyout. You don't want to get too far forward or you'll, uh, you won't have enough room to complete the rest of the floor. And 14 or 16 is, is the normal size yes. for a Cornuda? Yes, it is. All right, now go with the rib. I like to take two turns with the rib right at the back, and then I'll start up onto the buyout. Try and get in between the ribs which with each turn. And this is uh, not only add, adds a little bit of flash to the fly, but it's a little security. It's security for the buyout, but it also adds a little bit of weight at the rear end of the fly, which is really important to me. Uh, it's something that isn't in Renee's pattern uh, when I've seen him tie it. But I like to add it because I think the wire adds a little bit more weight to the back of the fly and helps with the tilting effect of the fly. So it, most of the mayflies hang like kind of like almost like a little bit of a hook and you, with the uh, with the thorax near the surface. And that having that wire on there helps to create that effect on the fly, and I think it's important, so that's why I do it. Now, well, something I do that probably isn't necessary, but I like to do it because actually this uh, this uh, the nymph on this fly has a, a pronounced uh, brown back on it, but yet the underside of the insect, when you flip it over, the, the nymph is a very pale olive. And so I just add a little bit of brown on top there. I don't think you really have to put that in, but I like to, because I'm fussy that way. All right, now we're going to go ahead and we're going to add a little bit of a thorax here. Again, I'm using this real bright chartreuse dubbing. I'm just going to put a little band of this dubbing in here to, for the thorax. And what you're doing here is, is tying on a section that will, that's meant to imitate the, uh, the emerging insect. So we'll go ahead and put a band of that dubbing in there. Okay, and then the next step is to take a matching pair of CDC. This is natural dun color. And uh, I tie them so that they flare away from one another. Uh, match them for size, which is about body length, maybe just ever, maybe a little bit shorter than body length. And then we'll go ahead and tie them in right in front of that. Whoops. We'll go ahead and tie them in right in front of the thorax of uh, dubbing. Secure that down. We'll take a couple turns there to secure it. The next thing I'll do is I'll move forward. I'll, I'll lift up the CDC, move forward, take several wraps here. And that helps to prop the CDC up a little bit, which I like. And then I'll come back into this little neck that I've created with the thread. And here we'll add the uh, hackle if I don't drop it. <laughs> All, All I have here is a simple dun hackle. Um, and you're not going to use a lot of it uh, if you're. This is one of those kind of flies where if you if you like to use saddle hackle, uh, you can really go a long way with it because you can tie, you're only using two or three turns of, uh, of hackle on each fly, so one saddle feather you can probably do a dozen of these flies with. Easy. Uh, Especially if you're tying small flies. Yeah, you know, if you're doing 18s or 20s, I mean, you can, you can go on forever. So then we'll go ahead and get the hackle player on here. So, I like to take three turns with the hackle, and then you're going to swing the, the hackle forward, bring the thread up around it to secure it right behind the eye. I like two turns to secure the hackle. Go ahead and trim out the stem. And at this point, you're pretty close to being done now. All you got to do is just create a little bit of a thread head here behind the eye. And you're ready for a whip finish. Last step here is just to take this the back side of the CDC here and trim it just past where the uh, dubbed uh, thorax is. And I trim that off there. And that's it. It's a completed fly. And as I say, uh, fantastic fly for the Cornuda hatch. I tie a, a variation of this for the Hendrickson. That's an exceptional fly. I've done really well with it. Uh, and you can tie it in smaller sizes. This is an excellent fly to fish for the Dorothea hatches that come in uh, later, you know, later in June in the evenings. Uh, <coughs> I've had good luck with this fly uh, fishing for the sulfurs on the West Branch, especially after they've been on the water for several weeks. Uh, As you well know, they've seen the you know most of everybody's patterns uh, for a while, and it's nice to show them something different, um, and it works really well. Yeah. How fishing the fishermen is really is really kind of clutch on our on our pressured water. Yeah, in the it East really Coast. is. Uh, uh, it's important. Uh, I, I think you know a lot of people like to take a real basic view toward their fly tying or what they're going to use for flies, but. 
on some of our summer hatches where the where the flies come off for several weeks to a month or more at a time, like the Dorothea, yeah. uh, the fish find themselves you know, get very used to the, the to the flies and become very uh, difficult to take. Not unlike um, uh, what Renee Harrop experiences in the West with the PMDs, because they hatch. Uh, for several months on the spring right. creeks and stuff out west, and, and, and he has the same problem, uh, finding you know that the fish can get real finicky to the flies after they've seen you know a lot of patterns for a while, and, and that's why he came up with this fly, and uh, I think it's an excellent fly for out there. I used it when I was out west in 07, and uh, it's a great fly for here on the east coast. Yeah, I'm glad you turned me on it. I've caught a ton of fish. Oh man, on it's, that a, fly. it's a it's a great fly. It really is fantastic okay. pattern. Thanks for coming on the podcast, John. Absolutely, excellent, Pleasure. sir. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank my good friend John Cavanaugh for returning to the podcast, tying up another killer pattern for us. I'd also like to thank our official sponsor, Regal Engineering, manufacturer of the world's finest fly tying vices and accessories. Additionally, I'd like to thank Kevin and the great folks over at Hatches Magazine for picking up our video feed. Go to their site, tons of great content. FYI, I'm running the official Regal Fly Tying School at Ramsey Outdoor in February and March. If you're local, that would be the NJ PA New York area. You'd like more info on that? Go visit our website. Find out everything you want to know. I'm Michael McCullough for RiseForumStudio.tv. Go get some.